today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. So once you have your film loaded, and then you have your lighten and darken. So once you have your film loaded, you've got your film speed set, light and darken wheel set. You want to cock the shutter here, just like that. And then you basically just want to focus and take your photo. So as we get near the end of 2022, I kind of realized it's been almost like five and a half years now since I started this channel focused on film photography here on YouTube and also since I started working primarily with film for my own photography work. So I thought it could be fun, hopefully helpful to put together a video where I share some of the like most important takeaways or lessons learned or advice or tips, whatever you want to call it, uh, for other film shooters, uh, especially those new to the craft. So number one is have a growth mindset and expect mistakes. So this first one, I think it's just important to adopt regardless of what you're working with or even just as a human being in general. But uh, film photography can be quite a humbling process. And I think it's important to accept if you're coming into this with previous experience uh, as a digital photographer, just that there's gonna be kind of this like endless learning curve. You're gonna make mistakes. And the quicker you can let go of your ego and just like immerse yourself in the process, the faster you're gonna learn. Uh, and in my own experience for me, I actually went to school for film years ago and then I got out and spent about 10 years working with digital and then got back into film. And it was interesting. There was this period at the start where there was some like stubbornness and some ego when it came to just like even things like working with a light meter where I was just like, ah, oh, I've used one of these before. I know what I'm doing. But the reality was is that it had been a really long time since I worked with one. There was a lot I needed to uh, learn or relearn. And it wasn't until I, I kind of let go a little bit and just like practiced and made mistakes, and researched, uh, it, that's when I really became confident with it. So the cool thing is now is it's these like opportunities for growth and kind of endless learning. It's part of what I love about film photography. It's always a challenge. There's always something new to learn. And I think just like embracing that uh, and fully immersing yourself is one of the most important things you can do. So number two is pick a format and camera that suits you best. So this one might sound pretty obvious, but I think, you know, getting into film, it can be really enticing to want to try out all these different things. There's nothing wrong with experimenting either, but say you start out with 35, you might feel like, oh, I need to go and shoot 645, or I need to shoot 6x7, or I need to shoot large format. Uh, and yeah, by all means, try them out. But I think what's most important is like finding what works best for you. Uh, in my opinion, there's no uh, bad format you know, most cameras are pretty good. And when it comes to choosing the one you wanna work with, I think what you should do, rather than being influenced by someone else telling you what you should use, is just pick the tool that suits you the best and helps you make the best work possible. I think the last thing you wanna do is end up using some sort of format or camera that becomes kind of a hindrance and that brings these limitations that end up affecting your work in a negative way. So number three, take the time to do some tests. So for a lot of us, when we first start working with film, I think there's this like intimidation that comes with it just because you can't see your images. You wonder if you're exposing properly or if the images are gonna turn out. And uh, for me throughout my career, what's been really important, you know, in television, in video production, in photography, is just like learning the tools that I'm working with to the best of my ability. So I have this like confidence and understanding to make decisions uh, when I'm out in the field. So with film, a big one has been doing like film exposure tests, uh, I've shared a bunch on this channel, uh, just to gain an understanding of how these specific films are gonna react in different situations. So I would highly recommend this. You know, if there's a, a film that you like working with, grab a couple rolls, do an exposure test, shoot one under different conditions, get it developed in a different way, whatever it is, depending on what you work with, just try and gain as much of an understanding as possible so that you have a confidence when you're out making photographs. And uh, recently I've been shooting, I would say like mostly HP5 for a lot of my personal work. And I've done an exposure test with HP5. Uh, I have done tests pushing HP5. And now when I'm out working with it, say if I get into like difficult lighting situations or you know scenes with heavy contrast, I can like make these, decisions and choose these specific settings and 
feel like really good about the decisions I'm making rather than just like crossing my fingers and hoping it works out. So film tests, even gear tests, whatever you're working with, I would highly recommend just take some time and try and gain an understanding as much as you can with the tools you're working with. Okay, number four is scan your film at home. So I understand that not everyone can buy a scanning setup at home, but if you can, I would highly recommend getting into scanning at home. Uh, obviously, you know, lab scans can be great from a quality standpoint uh, if you're working with a good lab. They're obviously super convenient as well. Uh, but the problem at times can be, you know, you can make these like wrong assumptions about specific potential technical issues or even uh, how certain film looks and stuff. You might think like, oh, I love the warmth of portrait, but the warmth of your portrait images just came uh, from the scan and not from the actual film itself. So this kind of ties in that last one, just about trying to like fully understand the tools and your process. Uh, a good example of this is when I was shooting in the uh, American West while I was traveling, I was sending my film out to get developed and scanned. And I did some night work for a period of time. And I remember getting the scans back and the shadows were just like really muddy. The images didn't look good. And I just assumed that I made some sort of mistake and underexposed and that's why they looked like that. And then not that long ago, I was going through my negative binders and I saw them again. And I thought, these actually don't look that bad, the negatives. And I thought I should rescan these and they actually scanned just fine. So there actually wasn't an issue with the exposure. It was just an issue with the scan itself, which at the time I made an assumption uh, about my abilities and kind of disregarded those images. So this can be a huge one. If you can scan at home, I think it's a really good way to like further understand your process, even understand things like exposure and color and just bring some consistency to your work. Okay, so we'll jump back into this video in a second. We just got to take a quick break to talk about the sponsor today, which is Squarespace. So if you're a photographer, a website is an incredibly important tool, not to only showcase your work to others, but it can also be great for structuring and previewing and planning out projects. So one of the things I love, they have all sorts of different templates, really clean, simple, professional looking, but they're also incredibly easy to use. I love that you can just click and drag to reorder photos and move them around. And then you can even make things like an online shop if you wanna sell prints or photo books, other things like that. So check out squarespace.com. You can sign up for a free trial, you can test it out. And when you're ready to launch, you can use my link below to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So if you spend any time in the film community, you'll be no stranger to the topic of film overexposure and just how flexible negative film can be and how it can tolerate quite a bit of overexposure. And well, to a degree that is true, the best approach still is to try and expose properly for the scene and for your creative intent. And just because like a specific film uh, can tolerate some overexposure, it doesn't mean that there won't be any other negative effects. Uh, for example, sometimes with color negative, if it's really dense, if you're scanning at home, uh, you can struggle to get like good conversions. You end up getting weird color casts or say your highlight areas are overexposed by a few stops. That doesn't mean they're going to still look the same as they would with a properly exposed negative. So uh, for example, again, for me working with the HP5, even though I know that's a really flexible film, I'm still being very careful when I'm spot metering, just say in like difficult situations, looking where my skies and my highlight areas are falling and just making sure things are staying within range of what I feel comfortable with. You know, even though the flexibility does have advantages at times, understand the film you're working with and still always when you can try and take as like as detailed and precise of an approach as possible. Okay, next up is be as organized and forward thinking with your images as possible. So with digital, you know, you download your images off of the camera to the computer, super straightforward. You have this master file at its highest quality, say if you're shooting raw. But with film and scanning, it can be pretty sloppy if you're not careful and get out of control. I learned this the hard way. With my American Mile project, uh, the first year when I was shooting it, I was on the road, so I was sending my film away to get scanned. And then for the next couple years, I was done traveling, I was back home, I was scanning on an Epson flatbed, uh, another model Epson flatbed, and then a CoolScan 9000. So basically all of the images I had 
were very different when it came to like resolution and overall quality. And when it came time to prep the files for the book, I had to go back and rescan, I think 95 of the 105 images and then convert and edit and do dust removal. And this was important to me, really important because I wanted the highest quality possible, but it ended up taking like weeks of time, which was like a really hard lesson learned, but also very important. So I wanted to include this one because I will say if you're working with film and you can, you know, try and be as forward thinking as possible. And when you go to scan your work, try and build out this collection that's organized of like these high quality master files right off the start. So if you go to print or submit your images um, or put them into a book or prep them, whatever it is, you have this collection you can pick from because as nice uh, as it is that we have these negatives there that we can always go back to and rescan, it does take a long, long time and it can be frustrating as well. So forward thinking and organization can save you a lot of headaches in the future. Okay, next up is buy tested gear and also expect that things are gonna go wrong. So especially if you're new to film, it can be so beneficial to make sure when you go to buy equipment that you're purchasing it from like another photographer who's been using it or from a shop where it's been tested. You know, there's nothing worse than like picking up a camera you're really excited about. Maybe you try and find like a deal on one and it hasn't been tested and you go and shoot a bunch of frames and shoot some rolls of film and then you get your film back. There was some major issue. It can be really disheartening and it also can just be a bit of a waste of time and money. So when you can, if you have the chance to buy tested gear, I would highly recommend it. But I would also say, you know, just expect and accept that things are also going to go wrong. You know, we're shooting oftentimes with older gear, even older electronic gear. Um, I sold my Pentax 645 a couple months back to someone. It was one of my main cameras. I used it all the time. I obviously sold it, listed as tested. And that photographer ended up having a bunch of issues with like frame overlap and frame spacing and stuff. Uh, and then they sent the camera back to me. And since then I've shot like eight rolls on it. It's been totally fine. So could have been a loading issue, could have been some weird technical issue, but I wanted to point that out because uh, I think it is important to accept it as, as well that at times working with this older film gear, there probably will be situations you run into where things just go wrong. So this last one is to photograph the work that excites you. So this one isn't specific to film, but it is really important. I think you really got to embrace, you know, whatever it is that interests you, that excites you, regardless of how many times it's been done before or how popular it is, especially if you're new to the craft. And I'm definitely not saying that you shouldn't try and like find work that's unique to yourself, but it's important to remember that to get to that point, you need to go through all of these different phases as a photographer. And uh, especially if you're new, there are these periods of experimentation where you're making work almost purely to discover uh, where it is you wanna go with things. And oftentimes that just means following whatever interests you. You gotta get out there, you gotta make lots of stuff. And as you do that, I think you discover little things along the way uh, that help you build up your voice and that ultimately lead you to making the work that you're supposed to make. Okay, so that's the list. Those are kind of the ones that came to mind right away and felt most important as advice for other film shooters, especially those new to this. I'd love to hear from you if you have any things that you would suggest as well that you think could help people leave a comment below but um that is it thank you for watching this one again as always i appreciate all the support and uh, i appreciate all of you watching these videos and checking out the channel and i will see you next week